Hey everyone and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we are going to be talking about episodes 242 through 244, which will cover manga chapters 240 or 342 through 346. And these three episodes have got some of the biggest and shocking twists in the series thus far and maybe probably one of in in the series as a whole. And yes, I can't wait to dive into them here. For the synopsis, the CP9 begin to make their move on Iceberg again, with the Straw Hats using this opportunity to get Robin. But as things unfold, things quickly reveal themselves to not be what they seem as the CP9 reveal their true identity and their true motivations. So differences. There aren't, again, very many differences as a lot of the Water 7 is adapted very faithfully. Uh, There's just a couple scenes that sort of pad out the time so that it fits the the 22 or whatever the 24 minute mark that each episode needs to hit but a couple of them are the scene with Frankie confronting Usopp at the going merry as he's preparing to kidnap him essentially and the merry and then we get another scene later on where Kokoro, Chimney, and Gombe are all walking through the streets as she's trying to sober up even though she's drinking at the same time that scene is also an added thing in the anime and then at the big moment where we see the reveal of Frankie being the one that actually has the blueprints to the Pluton, we see a couple flashback scenes of when Frankie first returns from his accident coming to meet Iceberg. And we see a young Iceberg and a young Califua and how they all recollect the fact that they know somebody named Cuddy Flam actually showed up four or five years ago. However, these flashback scenes do eventually show up later on down the line in a extended flashback. I'm not going to really go into whose flashback because it's a major spoiler. But yeah, these scenes will actually get eventually properly inserted into a flashback. So I'm not sure why they added them here though. But yeah, all these scenes are mainly just there to sort of pad out the time and don't necessarily really add or take anything away from the series. All right, so let's dive into my thoughts on these episodes. As everyone waits on guard for the impending attack, Iceberg asks to speak with Polly privately about something, and we don't quite yet know what that is. It seems Iceberg is trusting Polly to retrieve and keep something hidden safe from his office. Presumably, this is the thing that the world government officials have been after, and this is what the CP9 are after as well. Also further reinforced to me, is that Polly was one of the special shipwrights and made me believe even more that Polly was probably the one who was going to join the Straw Hats eventually. Okay, so one thing I have to mention in the anime, and especially if you're an anime-only watcher, it kind of ruins the twist and shock of the reveal later, but the woman that calls the mass CP9 man sounds almost exactly like Khalifa. They try to muffle and deepen the voice a bit, but it's still clearly her if you're paying attention. Um, obviously in the manga, this isn't really an issue since we can't hear her, but I wish they had done a bit more to mask her voice to maintain the actual surprise twist, uh, that it was at the time, even for just anime only watchers. Obviously, if you're a manga reader, you already knew about this, so it doesn't really matter. With that, the CP9 make their move with a decoy explosion causing confusion and chaos. However, before they can strategize on how to approach... By that time, Nami and Zoro realize Luffy is already gone. As Robin and the masked CP9 man are cornered again, he seems to have some sort of ability, most likely a devil fruit that allows him to disappear or teleport just as he did when Sanji was chasing them around town. It's later revealed that it is in fact a devil devil fruit called the Dordor fruit, which allows him to create doors out of anything and... He basically can turn himself into a door by touching some surface, which this ability is pretty, pretty good. I I gotta say, and and I don't want to spoil anything because obviously, you know, he, Bluno does show a lot more of this uh, ability later on. But yeah, this, this fruit is actually really good considering how stupid it seems aside from just, you know, being able to transport yourself quickly. So I remember when I first saw this ability, I was like, how is this ability very strong in terms of combat other than confusing your opponent? But Oda also proves me wrong, but I don't want to get too far into it. But during this attack, it's becoming quickly apparent that the CP9 agents are insanely strong with some crazy abilities 
as they're stronger than most of the shipwrights and quickly take care of them. They immediately close in on Iceberg and quickly get to him and immediately incapacitate him. And it becomes very clear to Iceberg that the Straw Hats had nothing to do with the initial assassination attempt and that the CP9 saw through and planned everything exactly to how it's going and it's not looking good for anyone at this point. We then cut back to Nami and company racing to the back of the Galila company because Nami, of course, being the soundest strategist, she deduces that with all the com- commotion in addition to Luffy attacking from the front, that the rear entrance will be left relatively unguarded. Of course, Zoro and Chopper adamantly agree to this, and even to us, this sounds like a very solid plan, but when they jump over the back fence in an epic fashion, it's revealed that there's like a hundred shipwrights still standing guard, and they're all shocked to find the guard isn't light at all, and <laughs> this subversion is so funny, and it's all to reveal the fact that Luffy actually got himself stuck between two buildings for some reason, which is kind of a foreshadow for later on, but I'll leave it at that. I don't even know how he gets stuck like this. Like, if he was going that fast, you'd think he would have just blown those buildings apart, but I get that this is for story's sake, so I'll accept it. But in a shocking development, the masked CP9 man has disposed of Kaku and Luchi, unbelievably, who we've seen to be somewhat on par with, you know, in strength with Luffy, and he's shown to take down Tilestone like it was nothing as well. So this one guy has just taken down three of the five strongest members of the Galila company, which in our mind begs the question, just how freaking strong are these CP9 guys? The other thing too is, <laughs> I, I don't know why they, they chose to do this in the anime, but when Tilestone swings that big hammer at, at Bluno, and for some reason the the hammer head like squishes and then it breaks apart like it's made of dough i mean in the manga it just breaks apart but it's such a weird like directorial decision to have the hammer head just like squish like that i don't know if that was just for like dramatic effect or anything but it looks so weird but not only are the cp9 shown to be really strong they also have some sort of separate abilities that allow them to perform these special techniques and we've already seen something called Geppo or Moonwalk, which allows them to walk on the sky. Or more specifically, they have double jumps. Tekkai, which is iron body, which seems to harden their bodies and defenses. Soru or Shave, which seems to allow them to move at super speeds. Just for future reference, though, I'm going to be referring to these techniques by their Japanese terms because it sounds cooler and I'm more used to calling it by their Japanese names. And as a quick aside... I have to talk about Zoro taking on the rear guards and saying he's not going to kill any of them as he's going to reverse his blades. But I feel like even if he does this, he's still hitting them with with a hard metal beam. And Zoro, you know, with his strength, I feel like would severely (laughs) injure them. And Nami and Chopper comically and rightfully call him out on this as they exclaim, you're still dealing fatal blows, by the way. In the next scene, we finally get some bombshell information and context on Iceberg Robin, and their relationship to each other. This scene is a huge exposition dump, but there's just so much juicy information dropped in here to the history and and bigger world of One Piece that you're really glued to this scene, even though it's just talking for the most part. We learn that Iceberg and Robin have never actually met, but they are incredibly intertwined and connected in that they are both in the same position of guarding the secret of the ancient weapon Pluton. Yes! That Pluton, the same one Crocodile was looking for in Alabasta. Iceberg knows about the ancient weapons, the Poneglyphs, as well as the fact that Robin is the only living person who can read and decipher the writings on them. Just as Cobra had confirmed that Robin did in fact lie to Crocodile about there being nothing about Pluton on the Poneglyph, Iceberg here also confirms the fact that the Poneglyphs do in fact contain information about the ancient weapons. If that wasn't enough, Iceberg reveals that he actually has the blueprints for the Pluton. And I mean, when I heard that, I was like, what? And we learn that it is an actual battleship that was built long ago on this island, Water 7. And I always wondered what the Pluton was actually was, as it was never described up till now. And I always pictured it as an actual weapon of some sort, like a big-ass cannon or an armored tank-like thing. But it turns out it's a battleship. I guess it makes sense in a world like One Piece that it would be a battleship. But how is it possible that something that's supposedly that ancient still exists? I think from context then, 
we can kind of deduce that there may be more than one Pluton, or at, least, at the very least, one does exist as described in the Poneglyphs, but that whoever made these had some intention of making more, hence the blueprints being left over. I say this because Iceberg mentioned that he only wanted to destroy the blueprints all this time, but has been unable to because Robin was still out there with the ability to find and resurrect the original Pluton. So that, to me, tells us that even if Iceberg destroyed his blueprints, the original Pluton is still somewhere out there to be found and used for evil. And if that time came, he needs his blueprints to make a second Pluton to fight back. Iceberg goes on to explain that his master, Tom, was always concerned over a girl from something called the Ohara Incident, where a little girl that was considered dangerous because she held the same ide ideology as the devils from Ohara. It's just a small breadcrumb, but we get another small glimpse into Robin's dark past. We see that Polly is no match for the two other CP9 agents, but before they make off with the blueprints, it's revealed that it's a fake. But before Polly is killed, Luffy comes charging in to interrupt them. Luffy is immediately restrained with the plan going off kilter and the reveal of the fake blueprints the CP9 all have to regroup. And I know I say this about every villain in One Piece, but Oda does such an amazing job establishing and showing us in very easily understandable terms just how strong his villains are and how much of a threat they pose to, again, get us super engaged in the threat of them and the story. Although this time it's definitely taken a lot longer because of the secrecy to fully reveal the real villains of this story arc. We get a great scene between Luffy and Polly kind of bonding as they're both trapped. Which adds more fuel to the Polly will be a straw hat theory for me at the time. Like, believe me, at the time this was airing, I was all aboard the Polly for the straw hat train. We've had some pretty crazy reveals with Pluton and, and Robin and, and Iceberg and everything. But that pales in comparison to the freaking mind-blowing reveal of who the CP9 actually are. And, oh my god, it turns out that it was Luchi, Kaku, Khalifa, and Bluno. Like, seriously, like, what? I remember I was completely blindsided by this twist reveal. But not in a way that I felt tricked or betrayed, like some twists feel like in other stories. Like, this was genuinely like, holy shit, I can't believe I didn't see this coming kind of way. Like, I love how you couldn't really tell from the voices other than Khalifa. Like, Luchi was obviously changing his voice and talking through Hattori, and Bluno changed his voice altogether. And kudos to Toy in the showrunners and the voice actors for hiding this fact. And the reveal itself is so perfectly handled as Luchi picks up his top hat from the decoy dead body and Hattori perches on his shoulder once more. It slowly dawns on you like, holy shit, it's an inside job. That's how they were able to do and know all these things about the company. It also explains their immense strength and just an insane sense of betrayal because... You kind of grew to really respect and like these characters only to find out they're the main villains. Like, I can't tell you how amazing this twist still is to this day. Like, it is a crazy twist. And on a side note, I love that Luchi's voice actor Tomokazi Seki as Luchi has this really authoritative and like almost buttery smooth yet menacing voice. But he's also the one actually doing the voice of Hattori this whole time. So he's doing that <laughs> like voice as well. And it's almost a completely different person talking. And I love that little detail that it's the same voice actor who's actually doing the ventriloquist voice of Hattori. <laughs> One thing I want to mention before we get into the events of episode 244, though, I have to say this episode is animated so beautifully and a couple of the next few episodes as well. The line work is like so crisp and the character models are like perfect. The coloring, the shading, the lighting all looks so deep and vibrant. It does make the characters a little bit more boxy and less round like traditionally One Piece is. But I really like the look of this like modified art style in this episode for some reason. Like they really wanted to give this like whole CP9 reveal the respect that it deserves. And they like upped their game in terms of animation quality in these few episodes. In addition, episodes 243 and 244 is where we finally get the new commercial eye captures for uh, Robin in 243, as well as Zoro and Nami in 244. And we'll continue to see, um, I believe Chopper shows up in the next one in 245, which we won't cover in this podcast, but in the next one. 
However, before we get to see more of this, we get a brief scene of Frankie abducting Usopp and the Mary to hold them as hostages to try and capture the other Straw Hats to get revenge on what they did to the Frankie house. It's interesting though that Frankie spends a great deal of time actually staring at Usopp as he desperately works on fixing the Mary and even decides to take the Mary and save it from the Aqua Laguna when it really seems like that's unnecessary, but we'll soon begin to understand why. Now obviously this scene, like I mentioned in the differences section, is not necessarily canon in the manga, but I feel like I, I like to think that, yeah, Frankie does start to care about the Mary a little bit. When we get back to Zoro, Nami, and Chopper, they're finally done downing the shipwrights, but I love that they're really starting to play up Zoro's serious lack of sense of direction. Like, it's bordering on absurdity now as he starts running the wrong direction even when Chopper is standing right next to him pointing where they should go next. <laughs> and, I mean, up till now, Zoro's had bad direction and, and even the reason why he became a bounty hunter is because he was bad at, you know, becoming, you know, directing himself. But as the series goes on, it's it's taken to a more comical, like, level and absurdity, abs- absurdity level and I, I don't know why. It's such a stupid joke, but it always makes me laugh watching Zoro just like absolutely get lost. Like only in One Piece can you have a badass scene where a character coolly takes down a bunch of guys and then epically sheathes his katana only then to have him look like a stupid cartoon character in the span of 30 seconds and still have the joke land without destroying that sense of badassery. Back to Luffy and Polly though. Luffy manages to get his limbs free by stretching his arms and stuff but one thing that always gets me is when he pulls his torso uh, you know up out of the waist shackle I feel like his shorts should have just been ripped off like cleanly the way he pulls himself up (laughs) I mean that's just a small nitpick but I mean watch that scene again like you you see his like pants like underneath the waist shackle you'd feel like you know his body stretches but like why does his pants just not get caught on the shackle because it looks like it should anyways Finally, getting back to the big reveal from the last episode, Luchi reveals they've been undercover for five years. I mean, talk about a long con. That is a long time to be undercover. And so, yeah, it shows their commitment to their job. I do like that Luchi mentions that even though they were undercover, they still performed their jobs as shipwrights seriously and didn't cut any corners. Luchi then reveals to us what the CP9 are. CP standing for Cypher Pole. Presumably, this is a reference to the real world Interpol or International Police Organization. And Cypher reveals, you know, refers to their secret and covert nature, and obviously, Pole being short for police. He then goes on to explain that they are the world government's intelligence agency, and there are eight bases all over the world from CP1 to CP8. So they're more like the US's CIA or the UK's MI6 than actual police forces like Interpol. However, CP9. A branch of the cipher pole that shouldn't exist is solely designed to carry out black ops missions and have been granted permission to not only use what's implied to be illegal methods, including killing, to get the intelligence from civilians that the world government desires. And this whole situation obviously brings up the age-old ethical dilemma of do the ends justify the means? And this is just my interpretation, but I think based on what Oda has shown us, and also just observing the general themes throughout the entire series, his general answer would be no, especially when the ones carrying these acts out have absolute power like those at the top of the world government do. I mean, he never has Luffy or any of the good guys kill anyone, even to an unbelievable degree, but nonetheless, Oda is showing us and his readers slash viewers that killing is not the way. And anyways, I don't want to get too deep into this philosophical discussion, But this is a very interesting topic to dive more into within the context of One Piece. If you are interested, you should definitely do some research um, because it is interesting. Luchi then explains that the world government has been afraid of these ancient weapons from resurfacing for a while now. But now, rather than waiting, they want to proactively seek them out to control them themselves and use them to wipe out the great age of pirates. As that is a threat to their control over the world. But here's where we get another huge twist and major reveal as Luchi begins to explain a hypothesis he has about where the real blueprints are. And this was another truly shocking twist that I had not seen coming at all either. Apparently I'm very stupid or very like bad at picking up on cues. It's revealed that Iceberg was part of a mysterious and legendary shipwright company called Tom's Workers. Again, there's that name Tom. Things are starting to come together now. 
Tom was a master shipwright that took on Iceberg as a disciple and taught him everything he knows, and presumably they were the ones that built the Puffing Tom sea train all those years ago. However, they were not alone as Tom had one more disciple named Cuddy Flam, and it was the three of them that actually worked together to build the sea train. It's then deduced that his mysterious second disciple, known as Cuddy Flam, was none other than Frankie, and that Frankie and Iceberg have a much deeper secret relationship than anyone had ever thought. No one made the connection that they were the same person because they all thought Cuddy Flam died in a terrible accident, but it can be surmised that he survived because he was somehow saved by being converted into a cyborg after that accident. It's all but confirmed that Frankie isn't a villain, and in fact, far from it if Iceberg trusted him to enough to keep the plans to Pluton safe, which is crazy, you know, crazy to think because Frankie doesn't seem like a guy who's very reliable, you know, with his kind of shady persona and out there personality. But there seems to be a lot more than meets the eye to this character. The thing that always caught my eye was how Iceberg tells him to leave the island to get the plans further away. But here he is. So at some point he either came back or never left at all. The thing I love most about this twist reveal and why it works so well is because it makes so much sense. Oda hit it really well, but upon rewatch, all the clues are there and everything lines up. So when you rewatch the beginning of Water 7, you're just thinking to yourself, why didn't I see this coming? Like how Frankie refers to pirates with disdain to in indicate that he has a sense of justice and is not necessarily really a criminal or villain. And the subtle concern he shows for Iceberg and his safety like during Luffy and Frankie's initial matchup when the Galila company reveals that there was an attempt on Iceberg's life, Frankie immediately reacts and asks if he's okay, which is, oh, again, I mentioned it, but it is a weird thing to, to ask. Then, while not in the manga, there's the fact that he seemed to react to Usopp's desire to fix the Mary. And then also Kokoro's friendliness towards Frankie makes a lot more sense here too, as it seems she knew Cuddy Flam, aka Frankie, in the past, be between that one little small snippet flashback. And throughout all this, that weird itch or that weird feeling that you couldn't quite put your finger on that Frankie wasn't quite a villain and that there was more to him, well, here it is. Like, that's basically why we all... There was, like, that, that sense, like, there's just something more to Frankie. And, yeah, it turns out that, that it's because of all those little breadcrumbs that Oda like leaves throughout the entire story makes you feel that sense and then yeah you kind of like think something's off but what is it and then Oda just hits you over the side of the head with these like twist reveals like it's just a it's just amazing to me how Oda juggled all these twist reveal story threads and kept them all not only logical and believable but hidden I mean it blows my mind every time he does something like this because this is not going to be the only time he does this and he's going to do it again a lot. And it always works. I've never read a twist in this series where I thought, oh, I saw that coming. Or, oh, that's so stupid. I mean, every single twist that Oda introduces, I feel like hits me pretty hard. The episode ends with both Zoro and Luffy busting into the room at the same time like the Kool-Aid man to cause a whole ruckus shock to everyone. But inversely, everyone else is shocked at the situ situation in front of them especially Polly, who can't believe what he's seeing. That ends these three episodes. But before we end the podcast, there is one thing I forgot to mention in one of the earlier podcasts was the ending theme, Eternal Post. So Eternal Post in the original uh, Japanese airing began on episode 231 and runs through episodes 245. However, as I mentioned, when we talked about Mirai Kokai, which was never actually broadcast in the West, it was skipped. And just immediately went to Eternal Post right away. So I forgot when the transition actually took place. And uh, before the next ending uh, gets introduced in the next podcast, I want to talk about Eternal Post here. Eternal Post is the 15th ending and is actually my second favorite ending in the entire series if you watched my uh, ending theme ranking episode. The song is performed by the Japanese hip-hop group Asia Engineer. And even though they had like four or five albums to their name, I think this was the only song that really resonated with me, sadly, because I really love this song. There's a whole lot to like about this song. I love how chill yet really engaging the song is, especially with it being the first rap song used in a One Piece ending theme. 
It just sounds really cool and really easy to listen to. In addition, the accompanying animation is awesome as it's a nostalgia trip as we get to see all the various character designs for each Straw Hat throughout the years and it's just really fun seeing the evolution of how they were drawn but also the changes in their outfits, especially Nami with her constant changing looks. The song itself, as its title indicates, uh, that it's about chasing after a treasure, more specifically not forgetting or giving up on a lifelong childhood dream, which obviously is very appropriate for One Piece. And of course, given the subject matter and the title of the song, this was most likely directly written for the series. But yeah, Eternal Post, definitely my second favorite ending theme, and I never skip it. It's just one of those songs I really love listening to. So, we close this podcast on yet another massive cliffhanger, as everyone is now aware of all the secrets, and it's up to Luffy and the others to go get Robin back and save Iceberg from the CP9, but I doubt it will be that simple. Anyways, if you did enjoy this, send me a like or comment, and if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. Check out my Instagram and Twitter account at Podcast if you want updates of when I post new episodes or see some pictures on my manga collection, please check those out. And again, thank you, thank you so much for, you know, all the the kind comments that everyone has sent me and and sort of the words of encouragement. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, this podcast is still pretty small. And so definitely hearing from those of you who are actually listening, I love that. So thank you so much. As always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out to listen to my podcast. Stay safe out there. Um, There will be a decent spoiler section after this, but if you're not interested in that, I will see you on the next episode. Bye. Alrighty, so spoiler section. Uh, There is definitely some bombs being dropped in these three episodes, uh, alluding to a few things in the future. First off, this is, I believe, the first mention of Ohara, which is Robin's home, you know, island. And we learned about the Ohara incident. And I don't want to get too deep into Ohara because we're going to get into that um, fairly soon. Well, more like 20 or 30 episodes. But, you know, it, it is contained in this arc. But the one thing I wanted to talk about was how Ohara is portrayed. Because obviously... Iceberg doesn't know the full story, and I guess to the world, and because of the propaganda that the world government and the Marines spread about Ohara, like he obviously thinks that they are quote unquote devils. And it's interesting how that perception of Ohara has persisted, and when that's clearly anything but the truth, as we learn from Robin and her experiences with Ohara, and they were actually very well meaning and kind people that were really just trying to uncover the history of the void century and because they got close too close to the answers and and the filling in that gap that the world government decided to call a buster call you know buster call on them and wipe them out essentially to extinction aside from robin and that has how she becomes you know the only person who can read the poneglyphs now And so, yeah, it is interesting. I I always found it very interesting that, you know, as we initially start off, Ohara is presented as this very evil place. But and and again, that kind of fuels the the doubt that we have on Robin. It's like, oh, she comes from this really dark background. But again, it's just a huge misunderstanding and propaganda from the world government. The next thing, obviously, I wanted to mention was Pluton. So this is another um, mention of Pluton and the first since Alabasta almost a hundred and some episodes ago. And we learn more about Pluton as it is a battleship and one of the ancient weapons. Now we'll go on to learn that there are two other ancient weapons. We already know about Poseidon from Skypiea. And eventually, once we get to Fishman Island, we will learn more about Uranus However, Uranus, we don't know anything about yet. Even where I'm at, you know, at chapter, what, 10, 1046? Um, and we still don't know anything about Uranus. But yeah, Pluton being revealed here and the plans to Pluton being um, available to Frankie. It's interesting. I, I don't know, really know what else to really say about Pluton, but it is interesting that this is now 
the second sort of or the third i guess um mention of an ancient weapon and we'll definitely go on to learn more about them so i don't want to talk too much about it but i just like to mention the, the fact that yeah it is interesting hearing about pluton now and sort of shaping our perception of them going forward in the series and then lastly i kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the cypher pole agencies so we obviously know about cp9 here and their cp1 through 8 and you know it's funny because like cp the cp uh agencies we don't really know too much about a lot of the other ones like we get a few glimpses of cp5 uh in the flashback um for tom or, or maybe it was for Robin. I, oh, shoot, I can't remember. But And then we see um, Wanze and the, uh, the really tall boxing guy who are both part of CP5 and CP7. We don't really know too much about them other than the fact that they are also intelligence agencies, but they are the only ones that are not permitted to sort of just kill civilians, just like CP9. And the other big one that we learn about much, much later on in Dress Rosa is CP0. And so CP0 is another sort of black ops um, branch of the CP agencies. And they are above even CP9 as they work directly for the world nobles. And it's interesting, the the introduction of both the um, CP9s who are dressed in masks, as well as the CP0s, once they are introduced, the three main CP0 agents the three strongest ones, are still masked. And in fact, even as I speak um, with chapters, what is it? I think it was 1043 or 1042 or something like that. Um, when Kaido beats uh, Luffy for the, I guess the, I don't know, the umpteenth time, and you have that one CP0 agent interfering with the fight, Presumably, Kaido just like straight up murders that guy, and we still don't even know his name. And so, yeah, I always find it interesting that masks are very intertwined with the CP9 and CP0 agencies. And we also do find out that, you know, after their defeat to Luffy, Luchi and Kaku eventually go on to joining the CP0. But yeah, I, I know I didn't really go that far into it. Just kind of like me rambling about, you know, the future. But um, I do appreciate you all listening and I will see you on the next episode. See ya.